Not all areas of the country have access to alternative pain treatments. It's easy to say use some non-opioid alternative, but in a lot of rural areas, patients don't have access to things like physical therapy and mindfulness meditation, and insurance companies won't pay for it. Where people live makes a difference. Lower income individuals do better in more affluent cities with highly educated populations and high levels of government expenditures, like New York City and San Francisco. Individuals in the top 1% of income have 10 to 15 more years to enjoy their richly funded lives and to spend time with their children and grandchildren, and they're pulling away from everyone else. It's as if the top income percentiles belong to one world, the world of the elite wealthy U.S. adults, whereas the bottom income percentiles each belong to separate worlds of poverty, each unhappy and unhealthy in its own way. U.S. middle-aged white Americans with relatively low education are experiencing rising mortality from alcoholism, drug addiction, and suicide. Poisonings is what the CDC classifies as drug overdoses. The U.S. is consuming about 95% of all of the world's supplies of opioid painkillers, and enough opioid painkillers are prescribed in the United States every year for every adult in the United States to be on opioids for one month a year. I mean, there's just an incredible outpouring of this stuff and it's killing people. We've got 110 people in America that die every day from this. We should really be thinking not just at a national level, but also at a local level about how to address life expectancy and health, because there really are big differences across places, and we should be thinking about how to change health behaviors in places like Gary, Indiana, focusing on the poor. And so one of the major domains of personality, the personality trait, openness, this was significantly increased again over a year after that single experience with psilocybin. Now changes in personality typically don't happen in adulthood, so this finding was really quite remarkable that personality could change from just one single experience. In large-scale studies of how people change slowly over time, researchers have found that openness typically declines as we age. We become more rigid, more conservative, less creative, and less likely to try new things as we grow older. But people who show slight increases in openness report being happier and more satisfied with life. They experience more moments of awe and inspiration. We've been taught since we were kids that the only things that are real are the things we can use language to name and our fingers to point to. We've been told to avoid the scary places in the world and the dark places in our minds. And we're so practiced in self-control and self-preservation that we can't even imagine what it might be like to open ourselves up to the magical and mystical realms of our natural world. And we've nearly obliterated the tools and traditions of our ancestors that might give us access. Thankfully, the mushrooms have not given up on us yet. So let me now segue into the, uh, our ongoing work with psilocybin and meditation. And we believe these can be viewed as complementary techniques for exploration of the nature of self and mind. So recent neuroimaging studies show that meditation uh, and psilocybin produce strikingly similar decreases in brain circuits responsible for self-referential processing. Uh, and um, and name, namely, there are different uh, structures in brain, the prefrontal uh, cortex, and uh, posterior cingulate that are major nodes of the so-called default net network that um, appears to underlie self-referential processing. And the interesting thing here is that um, just in the last couple of years, there have been two papers, one on meditation, one on psilocybin, that uh, show that meditation and psilocybin respectively decrease uh, communication within the default uh, mode network. This is Brewer, uh, PNAS, uh, 2011, compared meditators to control uh, seeing decreases in these brain hubs and, uh, uh, and also the, uh, uh, the connectedness between them in another analysis. Uh, um, 
And then Carhartt Harris, 2012, PNAS, uh, looking at acute effects of uh, psilocybin and again seeing decreases in the default mode network. Um, so, uh, so there's an underlying physiological rationale that supports this. Um, so let me say a little bit more about these complementary uh, approaches. So meditation techniques that have been developed over millennia represent a powerful approach to investigating the nature of mind and self. I don't think anyone would dispute that. But if meditation represents the systematic tried and true course of discovery of the nature of mind or self, we would argue that psilocybin represents the crash course. <laughs> so uh, this just is a list of bullet points I put up uh, that, uh, that I would suggest that psilocybin is a pharmacological tool that helps people uh, understand. And as I go through this, recognize that there, it's probably equally true of both meditation and psilocybin. So psilocybin helps people recognize how it feels to embody the present moment. Certainly true of meditation. To dispassionately observe and let go of pain, fear, and discomfort to transform a conventional sense of self, i.e. the ego, uh, you know, the fundamental learning from beginning meditators is that you're not your mind, and that certainly comes out very strongly in a psilocybin session. A recognition that mind is capable of revealing knowledge not readily accessible in everyday waking consciousness. And finally, the gain of an authoritative sense of the interconnectedness of all people and things. That's the the mystical type experience, true of psilocybin and meditation, we believe. So we have one study that uh, is ongoing right now. We've actually just completed. Not surprisingly, uh, psilocybin increased measures previously shown to be sensitive to hallucinogenic drugs. So there are perceptual changes such as visual illusions, greater emotionality like increased joy, peacefulness, less frequently fear or anxiety cognitive changes, such as a sense of meaning, sometimes suspiciousness. But by far and away, the most interesting effect was that in most volunteers, psilocybin produced large increases on scales, questionnaires, that are designed to measure naturally occurring mystical experiences, or non-dual states of awareness, if you will. So this shows uh, Results from two of these scales in the dose effect study just showing that we're getting dose related increases. The Hood scale had never before been used uh, after drug administration. And this just shows the percentage of the volunteers in the dose effect study who met criteria for having a so called complete mystical experience. And I'll, I'll describe those criteria in just a second. Um, but the point here is that about uh, it was 72 percent of volunteers in this study after 20 and or 30 milligrams per 70 kilogram reported having a full mystical experience. So here are the phenomenological dimensions of this mystical experience and I think it'll be familiar to this, uh, this audience. Uh, unity is a core feature. This is the sense of interconnectedness of all people and things. All is one, pure consciousness sometimes described as the void. Sacredness or reverence, uh, a noetic quality, a sense of encountering ultimate reality. People have the sense that this experience is more real and more true than everyday waking consciousness. Deeply felt positive mood often accompanies this experience. Universal joy, uh, love, peace, a sense of heart opening. Transcendence of time and space occurs, timelessness, past and present collapse into the present moment, space becomes absolutely vast, and finally ineffability and paradoxicality. These, uh, these kinds of experiences elude uh, uh, description. So, um, we, you know, we did a lot of these, the work with questionnaires, but we also had volunteers write down their experiences. And this is what one volunteer wrote uh, the evening after his uh, experience. In my mind's eye, I felt myself instinctively taking the posture of prayer in my head. I was on my knees, hands clasped in front of me, and I bowed to this force. 
I wasn't scared or threatened in any way. It was more about reverence, of, of uh, highlighted the defining features of the mystical experience here. I was showing my respect. I was humbled and honored to be in this presence. This presence was a feeling, not something that I saw or heard. I only felt it, but it felt more real than any reality I have experienced. And it was a familiar place too, one I had felt before. It, it was when I surrendered to this that I felt like I let go. I was gone, or should I say this earthly part of me was. It was still on the couch in some suspended form of animation awaiting my return. I was in the void. This void had a strange and indescribable quality to it, that there was nothing to it but this feeling of unconditional and undying love. It felt like my soul was basking in the feeling of this space. I have no idea how long this lasted. Time and space did not exist there. It was all different manifestations of this feeling of love that I found myself wrapped in. So uh, that's immediately after session. So what happens later? So here's two months later. They come back and we ask them questions like, well, looking back, how personally meaningful was this experience you had two months ago? This is a rating from uh, everyday experience, once a week, once a month, once a year, up to the top 10, top five, single most personally meaningful experience in my life. The fill bars show psilocybin, stripe bars show the control compound methylphenidate. Importantly here, 70% of these people are saying this is in the top five most meaningful experiences of my life. Um, they would compare it to the birth of a child, the firstborn child, or the death of a parent. It had salience uh, that uh, tr totally stunned me, frankly, when we began this research. And here's the answer to the question, how spiritually significant was this experience? Here we have fully, uh, again, 70% saying it's in the top five, but fully a third of these people who are already interested in spirituality and have practices saying it's the single most spiritual significant experience of their lives. And this shows uh, data from the dose effect study. Uh, again, just the rating of the top five most spiritually significant experiences. Uh, and in this case, um, we're getting uh, about 80% of people saying it's in the top five most spiritually significant experiences of their life. And if you look at the single most spiritually significant experience, it's about 45% of these. So it's really replicable across these studies. Now, this is showing data again at two months in which uh, volunteers uh, answer a whole series of questions and, uh, and the psilocybin is showing in the dark bar, the stripe bar is showing methylphenidate. You can see significant elevations here. And so volunteers here are attributing to the psilocybin session positive changes in attitudes about life and self, about mood, altruism and positive social effects, and behavior changes. So just to give you a, a sense of what they're endorsing here, the volunteers are saying about attitudes that they have more personal integration, greater inner authority. Uh, there's more meaning, enthusiasm, patience, optimism, authenticity, and self-confidence. In terms of mood, increased love, open-heartedness, joy, inner peace, decreased sadness, anger, uh, guilt, anxiety. In terms of the altruistic effects, more sensitivity, perceptive, compassionate, tolerant, increased positive relationships, greater uh, need for service to others. And this shows just in the dose effect study these same four domains and it's just showing you get nice dose related increases in the endorsement of these sorts of effects. So that's going out to one or two months. Here, here we are at 14 months follow up uh, asking some of the same questions. So uh, this is how spiritually significant was the experience. The green bar is, was two months after methylphenidate. The yellow bar was two months after psilocybin. The blue bar is 14 months after psilocybin. So there's no diminution here of these effects. They're uh, sustained and sustained uh, robustly. And not only that, um, a different analysis that we did shows that the attribution of these kinds of effects at 14 months 
is uh, directly a function of the endorsement of mystical experience immediately after the session. So it's, this isn't about just a psilocybin effect, because uh, the strength of the psilocybin effect isn't, isn't what's driving this. It's whether or not people endorse having a mystical experience. So it's that full, full gamut. And, um, and then, interestingly, uh, besides these questionnaires, uh, what we've shown is that psilocybin uh, occasions change, or these mystical experiences change personality. Um, and this is really interesting because personality is not supposed to be, personality is thought to be a, a pretty fixed characteristic of an individual after the age of about 25. And what we're showing here is increases in those people who have the mystical experience, increases in this personality domain of openness. Uh, openness is a really interesting factor in personality because it underlies uh, creativity and uh, openness and tolerance to new ideas. In addition to the volunteers reporting these effects, they were validated when we quizzed uh, community observers. So we did telephone ratings with uh, friends, family members, colleagues at work. And, uh, and had them rate the volunteer on a number of dimensions, and, and this simply confirmed the kinds of positive changes that were being reported uh, by the volunteers. So again, reverting to their own words, here now we're asking them at 14 months just to reflect back and tell us what you remember about this experience. So here's one person. The part that continues to stick out for me was the knowing and the seeing and the experience in every sense and fiber of my being, that all things are connected. Another one, the sense that all is one, that I experience the essence of the universe, the knowing that God asks nothing of us except to receive love. The feeling of no boundaries, where I didn't know where I ended and my surroundings began. Somehow, I was able to comprehend what oneness is. Finally, the understanding that in the eyes of God, all people abused, abusers, Christian fundamentalists, Muslim fundamentalists, atheists, were all equally important and equally loved by God. And that given the proper circumstances, I could be any one of them. 